When I was in second grade, our school building was getting painted and we couldn't go inside. So for a, about two weeks, we sat on big gallon tin cans under an oak tree. And I still think that's the best way to have class. Get all this stuff going here. All right, are we going? All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, before I get into class, and say we've had a we've had an interesting week. Well, we've always had an interesting week. Uh, some time ago, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell and uh, the Russian uh, USSR fell apart, and lots of countries gained their freedom. Shortly after it opened up, the Iron Curtain dropped. There was a young man who went to Kharkov, Ukraine, and uh, the elders at West Huntsville, where we were worshiping at the time, agreed to support him. So they made a trip or two, and they came back one Sunday and made their report and said the church is doing well there, but what they really want, the women want somebody to come and teach them how to teach their children. And my wife leaned over and said, I can do that. And I looked back at her and I said, well, go do it. <laughs> so she did. So she made four trips to Kharkov, spending a week or so there, working with the ladies and the teenagers and the, and the congregation there, and fell in love with the congregation. Now, we haven't had much contact with them for a while, but I asked her today, and she said they've posted the church is strong and growing. But we've spent the week watching the news and watching Kharkov being bombed and uh, feeling and knowing that we had people there that we had a connection with. So when, when we have prayer, let's pray for the, the church in Kharkov and the people in the Ukraine who don't want to go to war and the people in Russia who don't want war and the people all over the world that don't want this war started. So let's keep, uh, keep them all in our prayers. All right. Let's see if I can find stuff. I need two podiums, and I don't have but one. Uh, <clears throat> and I do need glasses, too. Yeah. All right. I'm going to talk about chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. I read through these verses trying to find some sort of theme, some something to that tied them all together. There's like three different segments uh, covered in these verses. Uh, so I thought today we would talk about, where did I point this? I thought today we'd talk about diversity. Now if you've watched the news lately or if you've watched uh, anything about current events or television shows or commercials, you'll know that the most important thing in the world is diversity. Uh, you must have a representative of every group and every oppressed group in any gathering or undertaking. So let me tell you, I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if any of you are, are planning to have surgery, if you're going to have open heart surgery, I can tell you, but based on what I have observed and seen, what you need to do is call your surgical staff into one room. Now, you don't, need to, you don't need to quiz them about where they went to medical school or what their grade point average was or how many successful surgeries they've had. All you have to do is line them up along the wall and count. Now, if you can count at least one white, one black, one male, one female, one Indian, one Asian, one gay, and one transgender, then you can relax, your surgery is going to be a success. Now, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, but I stand with my assertion. Diversity is not the most important thing. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it can be very helpful and very useful and fun and enjoyable. And uh, to prove that, let me show you some family pictures. Pictures out of my family album. 
This is the oldest picture that I'm aware of of the Wilson family. Now, kneeling in the front to the left is my great-grandfather, William Walker Bud Wilson. And kneeling next to him is my grandfather, Alice Alonzo Wilson. And in the group, there's several uncles, my grandfather's brothers and brother-in-laws in that group. And if you'll notice in the back row, standing with the oxen, there's a gentleman of extremely dark complexion. That's another bud. Now, he wasn't a slave. I don't think he was even a hired hand. He was just one of the neighbors, and they all worked together when there was work to be done. But my dad added to the diversity of the, of the Wilson family when he merged the family with this family. This is a family of farmers and musicians and singers and artists. And he merged with that family when the little baby being held there is my mother, being held by my grandfather. When 40 years after this picture was taken, my dad and my mother were married. By this time, she was uh, a widow uh, with a 13-year-old son. So there was an immediate family. And if there are any church historians in the group, that's Franklin Camp presiding at the wedding. And they added some more diversity by uh, adding to the family a very uh, intelligent, good-looking, and talented son. <laughs> and he grew up and added further to the diversity of the Wilson family by marrying a green-eyed blonde from Texas. And as far as I know, that's the first uh, Texan that the Wilson family ever had. I was going through this and Nancy said, you can't, you can't call me a Texican, that's Texas and Mexican. David, our son, is Texican. So, okay, I, I, got, I got educated. And these two went about to add considerable diversity to the family by adopting five children and adding a lot of diversity. Now there's also been added a granddaughter who is beautiful and charming. And as of about a month ago, the 20th of January, I now have five daughters. As my son married another green-eyed blonde, and now I have five daughters. A lot of diversity in that family. But you know, it continues. My extended family, there's, there's a, quite a bit of diversity there as well. Now, I'm not going to go through all this, I, I'm just one. Now, you, you can laugh, but let me introduce you to Jonathan Yellow Bear. Uh, he is an artist. He makes those magnificent flintlock rifles. And has, that's his business now. And he is also a frequent and I think a pretty good song leader at the Augusta Main Church of Christ. So you can laugh at my brother, but he's my brother. But Clifton, he's your brother too. <laughs> so diversity can be useful and fun and there's nothing wrong with it as long as it's kept in its proper place. Now what does this have to do with the verses today? Well, let's read some and see. Luke 8, verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another. Well, now there's how you get diversity. You go from town to town and village to village, and, you know, eventually he encountered Roman soldiers and Samaritan women, and who knows what manner of people he encountered in these travels. He went about proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Now there's a diverse group, carpenter, fisherman, tax collector, community organizer. There's just a lot of diversity there. Verse two, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had, been, had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. 
These women were helping to support out of their own means. Now, we don't know much about Susanna or the other women. Joanna was the wife of Herod's manager and as such was most likely close to wealth, uh, high social standing, political connections. As after all, her, her husband was manager of the king's household. Mary Magdalene uh, has no such resume to be reported. All we really know about her is that recently she had been freed from the possession of not one, but seven demons. Perhaps she lived much like Legion did when she was demon-possessed, so certainly not at the top of the social status. She's been tagged as being a prostitute, but we don't really have any information about that, but she was possessed with demons. She probably wasn't in the upper echelons of, of society. But these women all, they represent most likely a good deal of diversity, and yet they use their own resources, talents, and energy to form a support team for the spread of the gospel. They did so because of a unifying purpose. They may have had a great deal of diversity and it might have helped out, but they were able to become a support team because they had a single purpose. They loved God, they loved Jesus, and they wanted to serve him. Next part of our verses, Jesus speaks of a different kind of diversity. This is a diversity of thought, of mind, heart, of disposition, and circumstances. Oh, read that if you like or read along in your Bible. Starting in verse 4. While a large crowd was gathered and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and were choked by and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that, quote, Though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. Now this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. So that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. In this parable, the seed is the word of God and the different soils are the people to whom the word is offered. We can look at this from 
the perspective of the farmer, if we are sowing the seed, we can most certainly look at uh, what sort of uh, reception there would be uh, to those that we're, we're trying to teach. Or we can look at it from the perspective of the soil as the recipients of the word. And what sort of soil are we? And if we're not good soil, can we, can we change ourselves? There's the parable of the sower is given in Matthew and Mark also. And I've pulled a few references here to compare. There's slightly different wording of these. And I'm not too sure you can see that. I can't see the one back there. But the pathway represents a more or less immediate, and it, it, this, I, teaching's great because you learn all kinds of stuff that you never knew before. And I don't know that I know this, but it occurred to me that these represent, uh, the, the, the pathway is an immediate response. The rocky soil is a short-term response. The thorns is a long-term response. And the good ground is an eternal response. The pathway represents a more or less immediate failure to obtain, to understand, and keep the word of truth. This could be those who never hear the word, but it best describes a soil that is packed down so much that there is a hard, almost impenetrable crust so that the seed never even reaches the soil. Things we do not understand, we frequently reject. The rocky soil, when the seed land on a rock or rocks with only a thin layer of soil covering them, then the seed puts out roots. Uh, the seed puts out roots. They are never able to go deep enough to be refreshed with water and nutrients. They grow and flourish for a while, but when the sun comes out, the plants wither. Notice that all three accounts, they say the word was accepted with joy. But then when we get back to normal, to friends who begin to question, to classmates, to co-workers who perhaps ridicule, then they maybe even lose your job or your home for obeying the truth. We've heard, we know people that have been convicted and were baptized and got thrown out of their home or lost their job or decided they needed to give up their job. But it was accepted in great joy. And as I, as I noticed that, I was thinking back. We, uh, when we were first married, we were living over in Rogersville working with a congregation over there with the young people. And uh, Tuscaloosa, the student center there, put on a youth in action. Anybody remember that? Or anybody attend? I think well, Glenn Jameson would remember, but he's not here, and several, a couple of others. We thought that sounded pretty good, so we loaded up a van with our young people and went to Tuscaloosa. Now, the psychology of the youth in action was pretty good, looking back on it. We took our teenagers down, and we signed them up Friday afternoon. And then there were evening service, there were preachers, they had preachers from all over, youth ministers, and we had service that night, and I'm sure everybody was doing what I was doing. They were listening to the preaching and participating in the singing, but also looking around to see who was there. Is there anybody there that we know from somewhere else? Uh, what's everybody wearing? I'm sure the guys were looking to see if there were any pretty girls. And the girls were probably looking to see if there were any guys. But then Saturday morning, it start, started and went on all day. And as the day progressed, all these outside concerns fell away. And the focus became very sharp. And by the end of the day, there were a number of baptisms. There was a young man, in, I think he was in medical school, who was an avid atheist. He was baptized. 
But as we left going home, I'm thinking, these teenagers, these young people are so excited at, at hearing the truth. They're so enthusiastic. They're on fire for the Lord. But I wonder if they will be able to hold on. Some of you may be new Christians in here, but I suspect several of you have been Christians for 50, 60, 70 years. Maybe not 70, 50, 40, 50, 60. And you know that part of it is the enthusiasm and part of it is the tenacity to hang on. And I wonder if that's part of what, what happens here. It's always a concern. Next, he talks about thorns. These thorns can be a long-term threat. The seeds here put down roots, they grow, and they flourish. But so do the thorns. These seeds grow tall and have promise, not noticing that the thorns are slowly wrapping themselves around them and slowing their growth and finally choking them to death. The thorns, the vines, are life's worries, the deceitfulness of wealth, riches, pleasures, desires for other things. Now, these are not necessarily black, bad things, but you can get tied up in doing good things, doing good works, and still drift away from the Lord. This can be a long-term, a lifetime problem. Not every temptation or obstacle will go away. I know a lot of us, we, we deal with things and, and concerns of family and jobs. And I know the, uh, sometimes a, a good job can be consuming. Last time I heard the divorce rate for Huntsville de Police Department, does anybody know what that was? Anybody guess what it was? I heard it was 95%. Policemen get so involved in their job and adrenaline that it's rare. And I, I used to count up, well, I knew this family, they're, they're solid, and they're, but since then they've divorced. So good things can grow up and choke out our faith. And they don't necessarily go away. And Jesus explained this in another parable in Mark that follows, in, in Mark, this follows right after the sower parable. It's Mark 13, if you want to read along. But I'll read it. Quote, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who soweth good seeds in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when, the, uh, but when the, the blade was sprung up, see, when it sprang up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence hath come the tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So we may well live with the tares and the thorns our entire life. That's okay. Then the good soil. Yielding a crop a hundred times more. The black is the, is the parable and the red is the explanation of the parable, if you can see that at all. Produces a crop of 160 and 30 times as much as we're shown. Produced a crop some multiple of 30, 60, 100 times. But if you'll notice, slightly different language, but in all, hear the word 
accept it, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So on the good set soil is the soil that hears the word, the seed gets into the soil, you hear the word, accept it, retain it, and persevere, and then you produce a crop. It's interesting, Mike, that uh, <coughs> the seed was the word of God. Yes. We're the farm. Yeah. But the seed was sown. Uh, he, he might think, well, why did this farmer throw good seed on rocky soil? The farmer don't have time to <coughs> throw a handful of seed on the good soil and a handful of seed. He, it was sown indiscriminately without judgment. Yes. It was sown across the board. To everything. Everybody has an opportunity. But then when the time of testing, and that's kind of what we're in now, all of us, yeah. we're in the time of testing to see what kind of fruit we're going to produce. Yep. So we can't be judgmental on who we teach and who we can't teach. That's right. That's right. And we find ourselves, if, if we judge ourselves as the, as the soil, we can identify with all the different kinds, and we can, we can maybe change what we do. If, I don't know if, 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 you, if, if you're in the first group on the pathway, that, you know, somebody says something, how many, how many times do people come, come by and try to talk to you about religion and you don't you don't want to hear it well if you don't hear it there's there's no way to evaluate to understand it but if you accept it joyfully you you need to put down some roots if you're if we're the rocky ground and and we're new we need to put down some deep roots we need to study and study and read and learn and put down roots because the sun will come out and if we don't have a source of refreshment then we will wither and the tares are with us all the time and they will choke us out if we don't push them away and learn how to, to deal with them. The next part I just casually look at this, this seemed like a different parable but it's really not it's the tail end of the sower Starting in verse uh, 16. Well, let's see. Okay, I had the other parable that I didn't show you, but that's okay. All right, starting in verse 16. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come to see the light can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even that which they have will be taken from them. That relates to the, the sower. When the good soil receives the seed, the word of God, and accepts it, retains it, and perseveres, why would he want to hide it? If we have accepted it, and we've dedicated ourselves to it, then do we go around saying, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know. Uh, when people ask us, do we have uh, Ability to give a response to the hope that we have. The light is to be seen and to help other things to be seen. John 8 and 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And in Matthew 5, starting in verse 14, You are the light of the world. 
A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If we are to bring glory to the Father, it's very important that we listen well. The more we listen, study, learn, the better prepared we are to face chaos of life. And the less we attend to the word, the more it will slip away from us. So, what about all this diversity that we encounter? What, what does it mean? In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever or whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And I'm running out of voice. In uh, Matthew 24 and 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end shall come. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. All nations, not particular ones, but all nations. Galatians 3 and 26. For ye are the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seeds and heirs to according to the promise. And Jesus sums up this attitude toward diversity and its proper priority in the last few verses. In Luke 8 and 19, Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. But they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. Now we talked about a close group. This was Jesus' family. These were blood relatives. They shared the same DNA family. But he replied to them in verse 21. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So, question and answer time. You know the rules, you've got to have at least two questions before you can go home. Yeah, Mike. 